Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is chapter 2, part 4, 5, and 6. The Controlled Sector and the Uncontrolled Sector. A simple law like that of falling bodies is true only for conditions often wrongly referred to as ideal. It is not true for any actual body since it is true only for one falling in a vacuum. Through the operation of abstraction, outside disturbances are eliminated and the natural phenomenon reduced to occurring in rigorously consolidated conditions. In terms solely of time, space, and the force we call gravity. This is why we can find a simple law, a mathematical relation between time and space. Such a law involves the production of a definite object. Like every product, this object has a natural side and a human side, an objective content and a subjective meaning, a concrete aspect and an abstract aspect. The same holds good for geometrical space and clock time, whose definitions enable us to determine the object body falling in a vacuum and are determined by it in return. All activity, because it isolates an object in nature, constitutes an analysis of nature. As Engels points out in The Dialectics of Nature, even a crack a nut is to make an analysis. Activity separates, isolates, and consolidates, and hence breaks up and kills. Yet it is seeking to attain the living, fluid reality, which it can attain only by going on trying indefinitely. Its inner contradiction forces it to transcend itself. The analysis can never be complete. Moreover, the immobilization of the product is never complete. From the side of nature, which always reclaims the objects man has sought to abstract from it, any more than from the side of the activity, which is always moving on towards fresh determinations. There is no such thing as a pure theoretical activity whose exclusive purpose is an abstract dissection of the world an abstract identification of the diverse, or a complete immobilization of the fluid datum. The dialectic of activity develops into multiple relations. Deep within the world and without ever being separated from the total praxis, it carries on a massive analysis which can never be exclusively an analysis, but is always necessarily a synthesis. Activity makes manifest the relations of objects from, from the very fact of isolating them. The separated object is abstract, and the relation is then, is then the concrete. But once it has been isolated, the relation itself becomes abstract in respect of the object, and refers to the object, to the essence of the object. Activity thus moves perpetually from the abstract to the concrete and back again. It unites, having first separated, and vice versa. It reveals relations, having first isolated elements, and vice versa. Every product, every law, every property discovered in things, therefore, has a relative, approximate, and, and provisional character, as well as an objective and concrete character. The operation of consolidation enables us, in each case, to distinguish between two series of causes. On the one hand, there are the causes that can be easily isolated and grouped into clearly determined series relatively to the object and to the aim of the activity. On the other hand, there are the fine causes, which temporarily can be ignored and seen as intrusive. The action of the air on falling bodies, for example, since such causes represent the influence of the whole of nature on the object in question, they are always infinite in number. These fine causes may subsequently become the more interesting ones, but cognition always begins by eliminating them. In this way, it removes pure chance, although ready to acknowledge it later. The essential aim of the operation of consolidation is the production of a determin determinatism. What is true of every product is equally true of every determinism. It is a creation, which does not mean an arbitrary construct. Every determinism is subtracted by means of a practical and hence, in one sense, objective operation from the indefinite reality of nature, from outside disturbances, and from all effects of chance, qua chance. 
every determinism is a consolidated series. It has an objective significance and an objective reality, as well as something relative and subjective about it. Temporarily isolated, it acquires its significance from the relationships which inquiry can make manifest only by isolating it. In the sector which man controls and which is, therefore, on a human scale, the activity of production as a whole, the praxis, tends to the creation of a consolidated universe, a world made up of an immense number of determinate causes, causal series. From this point of view, mechanism is a vast instrument whose principal function is to establish relationships subject to human control a privileged instrument because it corresponds to the maximum success of the operation that aims at consolidating a determinism. Thus, there is something objective about mechanism and about determinism, but we must be careful not to see them as purely objective and turn them into a fatality. The determinism takes its place in the sum total of the, de of the determinations and objectives of activity. The sum total of determinisms constitutes a whole controlled by human activity. This sum total, organized by the praxis and in which the unity of the real is recovered, no partial determinism being able ever wholly to shatter it, is the truly concrete. Human activity, the praxis, introduces oppositions into the world, which it is able to do only by accentuating those already present there in embryo. It thus accentuates the character of those moments, aspects, or properties of the real, which have something distinct about them. It introduces into reality the oppositions of concrete and abstract, of necessity, necessity and chance, of causal determinism and finality. But at the same time, it introduces and produces dialectically their unity. Consolidation can lay down conditions for a becoming and consequently orientate it without thereby abolishing it. For example, in a tree which we plant and tend, the objective movement is simply being protected and directed. The activity of production is wary of contradictions or objective conflicts between forces because they may lead to the disruption of the desired consolidation. From one point of view, therefore, activity takes advantage of the oppositions, accentuating them and introducing new ones. But from another point of view, it is perpetually seeking to reduce and transcend the external contradiction. In general, contradiction is not admitted into the products of activity, except in the form of an equilibrium between opposing forces. This equilibrium leads to a temporary state of rest. Then, at the required moment and in determinate direction, a new force arrives to disturb it, one that has been carefully measured and apportioned out. Such equilibria can be observed in the theoretical constructs of mechanics or physics, as well as in the material constructs, which are objects, machines, etc. In this way, activity strives to consolidate the contradiction itself, to make it into an instrument and a, de and a determinism. Such an operation is feasible, it may succeed, but it is itself only relate relative and only true for an isolated object. It does not abolish either the dialectic of nature or that of activity. A great many, a great many mechanist and idealist philosophers have made the mistake of raising it to be an absolute. This is a sophism that can be avoided by passing on from consideration of the isolated product to consideration of the sum of products, from consideration of the partial activity to the movement of the total activity. Activity, activity does not abolish contradiction. It lives on it. At the selfsame moment, as it, is, as, it, as it is working to reduce it, it carries it within itself. It can bring it under control and create a higher unity only by causing it to be reborn to a more profound existence. There remains an immense sector outside man's control. Where nature is concerned, this uncontrolled sector is, for man, fatality or brute chance. Within man himself, it is known as pure spontaneity, the unconscious, or else as his psychological or social destiny. It includes everything which human activity has so far been unable to orientate and consolidate, everything not yet produced through man and for man. 
This means an immense part of the reality around and within man himself, which has not been humanized, has not yet become an object for the praxis. The activity of production contains within it this, the most profound of all contradictions, the agonizing opposition between man's power and his powerlessness, between the existence of one sector of reality that has been brought under control and consolidated by man, and another still in its natural state, between what makes man's life and what causes his death. At every moment, man finds himself cut off from what gives him his being and what he has not yet managed to master. Thus does his essence find itself vitally threatened, finds itself being dissociated and uprooted from existence. Spiritually or materially, man dies. This uncontrolled sector still includes, alas, almost the whole of man's natural and biological life, almost the whole of his psychological and social life. His power, which had seemed so great, suddenly appears infinitely fragile and susceptible. This sector is determined in the first place as existence, or external reality, and we can at once see that it is the existence which is the most inward and intimate. Our attitude towards this uncontrolled sector may be to explore it by non-scientific means, to interpret it, or to project more or less arbitrarily onto it a consciousness that belongs to the controlled sector. These phenomena of exploration, interpretation, and confusion or projection appeared as soon as the controlled sector came into existence. Exploration has been conducted by methods of literary or poetic expression. Interpretation and projection have given rise to myths and, and religions, which are essential elements of ideologies. The primitive mind, however, contained rational elements inasmuch as it made manifest the, new more, the newborn activity of production and its relation to the world. Primitive man had a more developed sense of the world's oneness than the fragmented man of our modern society. He had a muddled but vital perception of the unity of opposites. The so-called pre-logical mentality for which contradictory beings can constitute a unity contained an element of truth not acknowledged by the ethnographers who have judged it in terms of the rigid criteria of formal logic. Faced by the vast sector outside man's control, this primitive mentality also includes an attitude inspired by the sector that is under control and by the consciousness appropriate to that sector. To be more exact, it extends arbitrarily the consciousness it has borrowed from the controlled sector to the uncontrolled sector. The primitive mind believes it can get results by arbitrary techniques, by various forms of magic. This magic was at once an interpretation of the praxis. Primitive man was answering the question, why do we obtain such and such a result in such and such an action? An illusory but reassuring extension of the power of techniques to realities, both unknown and full of menace, a projection of human consciousness over the whole world, and finally, an exploration of the unknown, poetically as well as, at times, practically, in the case of medicine, alchemy, etc. The different forms of magic and religion do not seem to have originated in one pre-logical mentality, nor in one original magic, from which have come both religions and sciences, nor, finally, in a religion of sociological origin which inspired the whole of primitive behavior. The forms that are at present separated or opposed, religion, science, art, have resulted from the sociologically determined differentiation of the productive activity. Human consciousness based on this activity, but involved in the agonizing conflict between it and the world outside human, con and the world outside human control, including our physiological and sexual impulses, etc has sought a solution in religion and in aesthetic expression. All these forms of activity imply a sort of indirect attempt to understand and to govern the world outside our control. Scientific knowledge alone can fully realize this dominion. But if rational elements existed in the primitive mind, elements of intuition intended to complete formal logic, then inversely, the modern mind contains countless survivals of primitive ways of thought. The presence of the uncontrolled sector is more fascinating, 
more terrifying for us than it was for primitive man. Our authority is undermined, our rationality threatened. It seems that we must, at all costs and by any means, take possession of this uncontrolled sector. Mythical activity therefore persists. We are not content merely to explore the sector by methods heralding its conquest, such as certain psychological methods, nor are we content to express it aesthetically. We still want to picture it to ourselves, to console ourselves in it or else to disarm it, to render it harmless. Hence the persistence of religion, hence to the invention of new myths and new forms of magic. We can see how difficult it is to defend reason on purely rational grounds. Either reason is a living power, an activity that fights to conquer both in the world and in man, a power creative of order and unity, or else it is an impotent form destined to give way to mythical interpretation which fetishize the elements of nature, or social products, or both at once, the earth, race, state. If reason remains purely internal, it cannot fail to succumb to external authority. Physical Determinism Such a determinism cannot be absolute. It is relative and so approximate. It is relative to the human scale, to man's activity, and to the aims of this activity. We have got constantly to extend it and make it more thorough and link up new causal theories and new fragments of the world with more far-reaching theories and objectives. We have got therefore constantly to be examining critically the degree of determinism we have attained, whose truth can be found only in later. More extensive determinations, in which the critique of this determinism is reunited with the analysis of the activity that produced it. The degree of the degree of determinism reached by a certain science can only ever be thought of, therefore, as a moment. In other words, every mathematical, physical, chemical, biological, etc. determinism remains always open on one side to the whole of nature, and on another side to the activity of men. Here we meet again with the idea of the formation and consolidation of a world, our world, the one in which we are. This consolidation is relative and approximate. Our world re organizes and stabilizes itself relatively, but only by opening itself and extending itself towards those realities of nature which are on a scale other than the human. Such changes of scale pose fresh problems. The fine causes move into the forefront of our investigation. The relations thus obtained are not solely relations of the part of the whole of the part to the whole. The scientist introduces the notion of statistical determinism and formulates laws which cannot be deducted logically from the laws valid on another scale. This extension of our world has therefore been marked by the discovery of qualitatively distinct degrees of reality, whose laws are statistical in relation to the quantitative elements of which they are comprised, but in their turn, atomic in relation to higher degrees and wholes. Man's world thus appears as made up of emergences, of forms in the plastic sense of the, world, the word, and of rhythms which are born in nature and consolidated there relatively, even as they presuppose the becoming in nature. There is a human space and a human time, one side of which is in nature and the other side independent of it. It is obvious, for example, that the human rhythms, biological, psychological, and social time scales, the time scale of our own organism and that of the clock determine the way in which we perceive and conceive the world and even the laws we discover in it. But human time is abstract only from one point of view, the variable T of the physicists. From another, it is a fact of nature. The laws we discover may reflect our own duration, but they also have an objective meaning. To use a Hegelian formula, the tranquility of phenomena is measured by our own rhythm. But our rhythm is immersed in the rhythm of nature, and this is why foresight and induction are possible. We must not picture physical nature to ourselves as a juxtapositioning or sum of determinisms external one to another. Every determinism is a product, not an abstract construct of the pure intelligence, but a product of the praxis. 
The sum total of determinisms is thus a vast product of activity, an immense object, the world. This object must be understood partly in terms of nature and partly in terms of the productive activity, which is itself a whole not absolutely separate from nature. It is absurd in any case to try and picture nature in itself. In terms of determinism, nature cannot in itself be either indeterminate or determinate. Pure nature, that supremely concrete existence, is also for us the emptiest of abstractions. It lies on this side of all determinations as indifference, or a spontaneous becoming, as yet indeterminate for us, except to the most general and abstract laws of the dialectic. To insist on determining nature independently of the activity which, grounded in nature, penetrates it and comprehends it, by linking its scattered elements organically together, is to pose an insoluble problem, a metaphysical problem, which can be answered only by a myth. It is to try and think a world independently of the conditions under which a world can exist, independently of the idea of the world. The multiplicity of determinisms poses the problem of their unity. The activity of production breaks up the natural object into these determinisms, whose multiplicity is relative to the different sciences. Techniques and specialized forms of knowledge. The link between them, therefore, is man, actual, active man. In order to be able to shape his world and overcome nature, he has been obliged to fragment his activity and the objects of his activity. He has been obliged to think of himself from different angles, as a physical, tangible, invisible being, as a biological being, as dependent on mathematical calculations, etc., and likewise the other beings of his universe. The multiplicity of determinisms reveals objective articulations of the universe, and especially the existence of degrees that have a specific reality. However, it must not be taken as an absolute. This multiplicity is only momentary, for man is one and the world around him a whole. The breaking up of the universe into partial determinisms is constantly being overcome in life and in practice, and the dialectical unity continually reprodu reproduced. This will tend towards the higher unity to the extent that man manages to realize himself, to make of himself a specific unity enveloping nature. Then the natural sciences will be subordinated to the science of man. The science of man will be subordinated to natural science. The two will form a single science. Causal series and determinisms start from man and lead back to man. This analysis can be summed up in the formula the physical determinism is man in nature. This definition has to be taken in a dialectical sense. By stressing what is objective in the determinism, it shows that each determinism is located within the actual activity of a natural being acting on nature, of living man. In order to be understood in their multiplicity, in order for their, obje their objectivity to become conceivable, and, at the same time, for the unity to be determined, the sciences demand a dialectical theory of knowledge and the productive activity. Social Determinism Marx summed up the dialectical, complex, and eventful character of the historical becoming in a striking formula. Human affairs have generally progressed by their bad side. The precondition for most great civilizations has been slavery, Revolutions and wars have been needed before limited civilizations could be destroyed and surpassed. It needed the decadence of the ancient world for its limitations from the point of view of thought and social structure to pass away. The bad side gnaws away at, at and destroys the existence, bringing about its crisis and decline, and causing the elements of a new social reality to appear. In the first place, the negative is an accidental manifestation then it becomes a new essence appearing to begin with to begin with in humble external and sporadic form once it's originally isolated and impotent elements have increased in number it asserts itself as a new degree of reality thus did the first merchants of the middle ages give birth to the bourgeoisie while the first proletarians were ruined artisans rare at first in the 16th century then increasingly numerous until the new social reality, the new class, appeared. 
the reality of a social objective is comparable to that of material objects. A social object is a product of activity, abstract from one point of view, real and concrete from another, on which we are able to act for the very reason that it is objective and resistant, but not, but not a reality given to us in its natural state. A typical social object, the market, still exercises today a power over human beings exactly like that of the realities of the uncontrolled sector of nature. Within it are concealed the known and the unknown, appearance and reality. It may give rise to the application of a force or a specific method of action, which fashions it. More generally, material objects intervene in human society. They are goods. They are a stimulus to social activity, to human needs and relations, but they also impose certain determinations on this activity. In particular, the scarcity of consumable objects has, right from the earliest times up until our own day, though we are now entering on the age of plenty, unleashed struggles and rivalries that have extended the natural struggle for life into the realm of the social. The objects or products of human activity do not lose this initial characteristic when they become the bearers of social relations or when they give birth to specifically social objects such as the market. They continue to determine struggles and contradic contradictions within man's activity. From the general rivalry emerge the struggles of certain powerful groups, the social classes. Objects, therefore, determine the socioeconomic becoming and the social activity inasmuch as they are material objects in the first place, and later, properly speaking, social objects such as commodities as a whole or the market. The political action corresponds on the human plane, and so far as social relations are concerned, to practical action on nature. It acts through social relations as well as on them. It intervenes in conflicts and makes use of the conflicting forces. At no time in history have there been absolute dividing lines between epochs, civilizations, or classes. The socio-economic movement has always been a complex one. Political action has constantly striven con to contain this movement within determinate forms and to this end to eliminate disruptive elements. It has always tried to intervene in order to carve consolidated structures out of the spontaneous becoming. The forms of government, which are products of action, being applied to social relations by utilizing opposed forces, and hence always applied for the benefit of the more powerful of these forces. But here again, these attempts have, right up until our own day, caused ever more profound contradictions to appear and have prepared the way for the emergence of new forces and forms. This analysis too can be summed up in a formula. The social determinism is nature and man. The social determinism in fact is what makes a specifically human activity possible. It conditions it, but it also limits it. The social determinism makes man's freedom possible, yet it is also opposed to it. It, origin it originates its natural objectivity which is extended into the objectivity of fetishes and the specific objectivity of social relations. It originates also in natural determinations, the scarcity of goods, the natural struggle for life. Social realities and social objects appear as the consequence of spontaneous processes comparable to those revealed by the sciences of nature, as the statistical results of elementary phenomena. The social determinism is thus the inhuman within the human, the continuation into the human of natural conflicts and biological realities. It is man as yet unrealized, nature in man.